Being an author takes guts. By making such a declaration as an author, you are subjected to both good and bad criticism. And writing from a personal experience on taboo subjects and putting it all out there takes courage. One author who is not afraid to put her thoughts and personal experiences on a taboo subject out there in the public sphere is our own Nashiba Bezi, attorney, psychotherapist, and author. She joins us now for our, for our SKN Connections from Washington State. Good morning, Nashiba, and welcome to Good Morning SKN. Thank hey, you so for let's, having me. You are certainly welcome. It's our pleasure indeed. So let's start by sharing who is your favorite author? Who is my favorite author? Um, I don't have a, I wouldn't say that I have a favorite author, but of course, all of my, the authors that I, I like would be, you know, having to do with psychology. Okay. And um, there are a lot of texts, but I, I, I don't know that I have a favorite one. Okay. Did you ever consider writing under a pseudonym? Um, I've thought about that, but, but at the same time, I wanted to use my real name because I wanted people to be able to identify the author and, you know, know that it's me. I wanted to be real about it, what I'm writing about. And as you can tell, you can find me on psychology today and all of that. So using my real name was important for me to do that. So how do you respond to the reviews of your book? both good and bad? Some of them, um, I mean, it's a triggering topic. And so I've spent, you know, a lot of time trying to, you know, just being there for people who have reached out based on some of the excerpts I've put out. And um, it's, it's one of those difficult topics. So the reviews, uh, you know, like, people just sharing and saying what I got a lot of is that, Oh, it's relatable. Okay. Good stuff. It's yeah. relatable. I imagine you might've gotten, uh, you know, some people telling you it's therapeutic as well, because in some instances yes. I can only imagine that you are voicing some of the things that they were not able to voice themselves. Is that the case? Yes, and that is so true. Uh, it is, you have a lot of people who are just afraid to talk about this in public, this topic in public. And then you have those people who may not even know, you know, have a name to put to what they're experiencing. And so, yes, I like to say that I'll be the voice for those who don't have one. We know social media is a big thing these days. So how has it changed the way you interact with your readers as an author? As an author. So at times when I post, I usually, if I can turn off comments, I would. If I can't, then I would just maybe sometimes not respond to the comments or, you know, I would do it maybe direct. The reason being is because, again, I'm a psychotherapist. And so I have to be very careful with how I interact with people who are reaching out to me on social media because of that, you know, that title. And so, again, I recognize it's a triggering topic. And so I don't want people to just put things out there, their personal stuff out there, what they're going through, and then I'm not able to respond to them in a therapeutic way. Well, that definitely informs your background, informs your treatment of the topic and your treatment of the people who are suffering uh, because of the topic that is taboo. Uh, was this book at all challenging to write? It was challenging to write in the sense that I am from St. Kitts. And that is important to make mention. And part of the challenge is that I come from a cultural background, as you guys know, who would, this, this is a topic that would be like, you know, like we say, taboo. Yeah. And um, all of my family are back in St. Kitts. And to come out with a story such as this one, I and, and, and 
just be so bold with it because I curse, I have curse words in it. I have, you know, just being real. And so I think that was the, the biggest challenge for me is just putting those things out there in that way, in such a real way, and just wondering how my family would take it. Are you at liberty to share how they took it? Well, I haven't really spoken to any of them in depth about what's in the book. My sister I have spoken to, she knows a little bit about it, um, but she doesn't know all that's in it. She doesn't know the depth oh. of what I've written. Oh, well, to, well today they, they will become inquisitive as to what you have written because of what you just said. <laughs> and that's okay, that's okay. Again, I'm not, um, I've thought about it. I thought about it before I even started writing the book and I thought about, you know, who would read it the audience and i thought about what that would mean for me you know putting myself out yeah. there even as a professional and then i thought okay well if this can benefit one person then that's 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 good enough for me and i feel like as if i am in a position right now where i am not afraid to talk about this topic i am not afraid to share about me i've been through it i've been through it and i can talk about it from a personal standpoint and from a professional standpoint. And so I chose to do that from a personal standpoint because I think that would be most impactful. And that makes you very brave in my yeah. estimation and very helpful and altruistic as well. So thank you so much for being You're as welcome. as you are. You're welcome. All right, have you ever experienced a uh, writer's block any part in this at all? Yes, I did. There were times when I would get to a certain part and then I would have to take some time to, you know, just process it all. And then I would be like, uh, I don't know what else to write. It would be in my head, but I just sometimes just can't get, you know, to writing. And so that could be because of me just kind of like, you know, processing it. Or it could be writer's block. Uh, I, I, it's hard to differentiate at times what it really is, because again, for me, as I am writing, that is also me going through my healing process. Absolutely right. I understand where you're coming from. So can you explain the relevance and timeliness of the content and issue highlighted in the book, Let Love Be Love After Sexual Trauma? So this book talks about again, just being able to love or accept love after you've been through so much difficult situations that left sexual trauma that stemmed from domestic violence, intimate partner violence, or sexual abuse, or molestation. And when I say that, I'm not just speaking about me. This is something, this is a topic for so many people. And so just, just talking about my experiences, um, you know, from growing up to being a married woman and, you know, going through all that trauma from these relationships and then just now having to have someone who is in my life who... I can, you know, I feel a difference with, and then that's when I realized how bad it was for me. That's when I was able to identify my sexual trauma. So that's basically what's, what it's about. And, and I, 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 I don't think I can talk about sexual trauma without talking about sex. So that some of that is in the book as well. And um, yeah. All right. So and you're absolutely right on that point as well. You can't talk about one or the other. Your take on it is quite interesting to me because uh, in, in dealing with, um, you know, the issue of sexual trauma, that tends to be the focus and the healing generally comes. But you're talking about the love aspect after as well. And it's, it's a very, dare I say, novel concept in these parts. Um, yes, I, I see that you're yes. reacting to it, please. <laughs> <laughs> I would say yes. And that's one of the reasons why I chose to go that way, because we we, we hear about the, the abuse and the molestation, the sexual assault, and we hear about all of that, but we don't 
get to hear about the psychological impact that stays with the person. We don't get to hear the stories about the marriages that were broken because people are not able to trust each other. They're not able to love each other. They're not able to accept love from each other and and you know intimacy and that's what i had to learn and and so in this book although it's coming out as sex it's more it's more than sex it's intimacy and just being able to have that experience and so i wanted people to hear that other side because it's it's painful it's painful when you have to go through that part but who talks about that and who talks about what happens after that after the sexual abuse there's a wow. lot that goes on after that life just doesn't just does just doesn't go on i'm going to read an excerpt from uh your book and i'm going to have you react to it all right so here was okay. the excerpt and this is what you wrote it took me years to recognize that i had residual sexual trauma that needed to be addressed it was a painful recognition because i was not ready for it i did not even know how far back in my past I needed to go to find the root of my trauma. However, once it was uncovered, I knew it was deeply rooted. Those words, walk us through those words, please, and what they mean to you. So what that means is by the time I was able to recognize and you know, identify it and put a name to it and, and call it sexual trauma, I didn't know exactly where it started or where, you know, parts of my memories, I had suppressed so much. And so that's why I said, you know, it could be deeply rooted. I knew it was deeply rooted because I started thinking back and my experiences over the years. And then I recognized I was able to make the association to some of the experiences in my life, which went way back to my even being a teenager. So that's what that means. Well, thank you for sharing that. It's just so, honestly, as I, as I read it, it, it had me hooked, Nishima, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's the kind of writing that literally pulled me in, and I wanted to know exactly where it was going, you know, what, what else you had to say. And I think that that's going to be the response for from the readers as well. Yeah, and nice. I have my part that I took out. So Chris was touching my face and kissing me, but it still felt like a dream. And I was not stopping him in this dream. I did not have the urge to stop him. And I was no longer just laying there. I was willingly participating. Chris then asks, may I touch you? <laughs> <laughs> so and those last words were very important to me it was it was one of those situations where I was like oh did he just ask to touch me and that for me just validated that you know my body belongs to me it's my body yes. like he asked for permission to touch me yes. even though he had already kissed me and so that was a powerful moment. And what, when I say I wasn't just laying there, I was participating because by that time, I recognized that my defenses were trying to come in, but I wanted to be in that moment. I was willing. That's when I decided I have to heal. I am willing to go through this healing process, and this is how I have to go through it. So I allowed myself to be present in that moment with him. And that's why I said I was willingly participating. I wasn't trying to stop him. I wasn't trying to, it wasn't like my mind wasn't somewhere else. I wasn't, you know, trying to be like, oh, feel, I wasn't feeling all ghost out. And, and this is because of previous experiences. That's what I would feel. So because at this point, I recognized it and I said, okay, I have to do something about it. I need to heal from this. And this is the person I am allowing to go through this with me or to take me there. As I'm hearing you speak to that, I'm getting the sense of control that it seems that you regained and this recognition that you were in fact the one in control. 
Is that accurate? That is accurate. And I'm getting goosebumps on my skin because that to me said, you, you know, that empowered me. That, that for me said, again, you have control of your body, not me. Your body does not belong to, well, I, in terms of talking about Chris, he, without saying it, these specific words, those words, may I touch you, said, it's your body. You decide what you want to do. I wasn't raped. I wasn't, you know, molested. I was willingly participating. And that said that th this is your body. You can say no. So that's what's powerful about those words. With all of that said, how did you come up with the title for your book? So one day I, <laughs> I was having all these emotions and, you know, you know how sometimes you want to love somebody and then you don't want to love them because you're afraid. You're like, I don't want to go through this again. And you're like, okay, I don't want to get hurt and I don't want, but, 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 but there's these feelings, these emotions that I feel like I can't, I couldn't stop. And I just felt so overwhelmed. And some of them were so new to me. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not used to these feelings where I love somebody this way. And I don't want to love him this way because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do that. And so it's almost like I'm fighting with myself. My 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 two minds, I always say my two minds, because you know how you have <laughs> one mind telling you one thing, yeah. one mind saying the next. But then what happened is my body is also chipping in and speaking yeah. so my body wants him but my one mind is saying you better not then the other mind is saying you better do it and so there's so much going on there and i started feeling so overwhelmed and i i i, I said it to chris and i was like oh i feel so overwhelmed i i i love you and i want to know that you love me too um but i sometimes i don't want to love you and i get so overwhelmed and then i paused and then he said why are you so overwhelmed? Mm -hmm. Why can't you just let love be love? Yeah. And that's love with love. Oh, that's so sweet. So he gave you the title. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. Don't do that. <laughs> We're not saying that. <laughs> well, we are not saying that. We're not that. saying that. No, we can't let him hear that. No, we're no, not no, going to no. let him. We won't. We promise we won't let him hear that one. We promise no, we won't. No. <laughs> If only we could recall that, but we can't. <laughs> All right, in our final moments, Nishima, we'd like to know, uh, how did you celebrate when you finished writing this book? I haven't celebrated yet. I, I haven't. And you know what? The person who's been there with me for this, you know, doing my, actually who did my book cover is my son. He's 18. And so when, when, He's the one I'm going to celebrate with, not Chris, my son. <laughs> oh, I'll celebrate with Chris another time. But, but, right. but, but my son, I I have to give, I have to give, you know, I have to say thanks to him. And again, he's 18 and he's been there with me through some of this stuff. You know, he's been there when I was going through some of that stuff and he knows of it. And so I, I thought, well, you know what? My son knows. He knows when I was, he, he knows some of the things about the times when I was being raped and he knows about the abuse. I mean, he went through it with me. And so I said, well, you know, he's old enough to know. I want him to know how, how it feels to be on the other side. I want him to know that you can get through it. You can heal and you can get through it. I want him to know that his mom is experiencing something different to what he saw growing up. And I also want him to know how to treat a lady.